Hey Nick, do you remember episode one? Released 24th of March 2020. No, I didn't know about Tasmanian whiskey, but now I do, and now I want to find out more about it. And we should do a Tasmanian whiskey at some point. Barely. Barely. Don't you mean barley? Anyway, <laughs> well, we've only gone and done it. It's taken 60 episodes, but this week for World Whiskey Day, we finally sample a whiskey from Tasmania. Oh yes, we're tasting the Australian rye whiskey produced at the Belgrove Distillery and bottled by that boutique rye company. And to tell us all about this unique creation and to fill us in in all things boutique whiskey company, the uncorked whiskey sessions and much, much more, we have Sam Simmons and Dave Worthington joining us. As always, you can see some more whiskey-based content, images and videos, etc. on all our social media platforms at Whiskey and Things Podcast on Instagram and at Whiskey and Things on Facebook and Twitter. And it would help us out if you rate, review and subscribe on all your favourite podcast platforms. You're listening to the Whiskey and Things Podcast with Dave Giles and Nick Kent. Welcome to episode 6060. I am Dave Giles. And I'm Nick Kent. Welcome everyone. It's the big 60. Wow, what a show we have in store for you. Action packed. Absolutely. Do you know what? It's so action packed, Nick. I think we should just start straight off. Just get it straight out. You know. Oh, what? Oh. 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 Who's round? We're not even doing an extra sting. Straight. straight uh, unbelievable. Straight oh, away. Straight out of the blocks. Straight out of the blocks. Straight out of the blocks. It's almost like we've got a really long interview to get to for some reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or something. A damn good interview, though. Damn good interview. Well, we thought we'd start today with a cheeky little booze round. Uh, so it, it is World Whiskey Day this week, and that's this Saturday, May the 15th. It's World Whiskey Day. Not to be confused with International Whiskey Day, which we celebrated back on St. Patrick's Day on March the 17th to honour whiskey writer Michael Jackson and to support Parkinson's disease research. No, World Whiskey Day is a day simply to celebrate whiskey. So, Nick... What is it? It certainly is. Just to celebrate whiskey. Uh, This is from their website. I'm going to do the official bit. Oh, Um, nice. World Whiskey Day invites everyone to try a dram and to celebrate the water of life. Taking place annually on the third Saturday in May, this special occasion is celebrated by whiskey lovers worldwide with tastings, events, and gatherings. This is the 10th year they've been doing it. it oh, a, nice. Yeah, originally started by whiskey consultant and author Blair Bowman back in 2012. And yes, it's just a day where people can kind of appreciate, get together, etc. And they're doing something a bit different this year. Um, like everything, it's always a bit different, isn't it? At the moment, um, they're doing the World Whiskey Weekender, which is an online event running from the 14th to the 16th of May, this weekend, funnily enough. Um, So, over four channels, I'm guessing channels, they mean um, different platforms, like Facebook. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. We'll have a link in the description to this, everyone. So, over four channels and over 30 sessions, um, they're going to be showing distillery tours. Um, They're going to be going into the history of Japanese whiskey, discussions on sustainable whiskey distilling and the rise of craft whiskey, um, new world whiskies, and uh, they're also doing some stuff about how to get a job in the whiskey industry as well. So, it's pretty. uh, there's a lot going on this weekend as well. That yeah. sounds really fun. Yeah. Well, we should do can, that. Yeah. You can chat to the other attendees and all the sessions will be available on demand afterwards in case you miss it live, in case there's any other whiskey events going on, say this Saturday, which we might be talking about later on. <laughs> they will start around six or seven in the evening as well. So it's not the whole day. That's the evening. It's 15 pounds. If you want to get involved, that's 17 euros or $21, depending on where you are for the full access for the three days days so if you get involved in that enjoy yourselves everyone yeah please do uh, also we've been booze round um we, we are very aware that the san francisco world spirits competition uh, the winners have been announced this week but we're going to cover that next week because today we've got such a good interview lined up for you today it's something i've been really excited about doing since we were at the whiskey show and we finally made it happen and we've, we've timed this perfectly so without any more uh talk let's just get to this shall we nick I think we should get to Let's it. Let's get to the meat and veg of the situation. I'm, who's meat and who's veg? <laughs> <laughs> That's not for us to decide, Dave. That's yes, not for us. okay. You, well, let, let us know in the comments. We'll uh, panel. <laughs> let us know afterwards <laughs> what you think. Uh, but, but right now, please do prepare yourself for a wonderful interview with Dave Worthington 
and Sam Simmons, a.k.a. Boutique Dave and Dr. Whiskey. <laughs> I'm wearing my Boutique T-shirt, as you, as you might be able to see. Um, or if you're listening, you can't, but I am wearing a Boutique T-shirt, which... I won the very first day I ever heard of you, of the two of you. Now, I'm a bit of a noob when it comes to whiskey in the last year. And it was at the whiskey show, and I logged in, and it was quite overwhelming, everything that was going on. And uh, I was like, what do I click on? I have no idea. And there was a session that said tea time with the boutique company. And I was like, tea? Yes, that suits me. <laughs> <laughs> so I clicked and right had the best street. time, the best time uh, with the two of you. And that became part of my daily routine. Uh, and I was gutted at the end of the show. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't there anymore at lunchtime. So uh, thank you very much for joining us um, this evening. Uh, I'll stop talking in a moment. But this evening, Nick and I are going to be sipping on the, one of the new boutique releases, this uh Australian rye distilled at Belgrove Dis- Distillery in Tasmania, of all places, yeah. and we'll discuss that later. But before we get into all of that, let's hear a bit about you two and what you do. So first of all, we'll start with Dave. Please tell us, how did you get into the world of whiskey? Firstly, thanks for um, having us here. Um, nice to see the T-shirt, and it's nice to put a, a, a face to uh, to a Twitter handle, basically. Uh, <laughs> I spend a lot of time speaking to you on Twitter. And yeah, yeah, the afternoon tea sessions that we did was something we started up right at the beginning of lockdown. But how did I get into whiskey? Yeah, it's a very short story. Um, my, I was an engineer. My sales manager brought in a whiskey one day and said, try this, twisted my arm. Um, and I liked it. That was, that was a short story. And uh, I, I loved <laughs> it. And um, I just wanted to know everything about whiskey. I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. Um, and I throw myself into anything that I enjoy 100%. Um, and uh, whiskey was the next thing after my rugby career was over. Uh, rugby career, I say I was coaching and teaching and my knees gave away. Uh, and so there's no, lo- no, no way I could be running around the pitch anymore. And um, yeah, whiskey was the next thing I could get into and I could get my teeth into it. And um, yes, you started started a blog like lots of people did in those days, started a whiskey blog uh, and then went to a whiskey show and thought, oh man, I love this industry. And I want to stand on that side of the stick and pour whiskey to everyone and talk to people because I love talking to people. So uh, yeah, I think one year after my first whiskey festival, I put my hand up and said, if you need a hand... Um, I'd love to do that. Think, yeah, sure. Come on board, Dave. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, help. You can pour balconies. Oh, mostly into my glass, I think it was. But yeah, I pretended, <laughs> pretended to be Chip Tate for the weekend while Chip Tate went and did his stuff. And yeah, it just snowballed from there. But basically a whiskey blog, uh, attending whiskey shows and putting your hand up, volunteering, um, and then being in the right place at the right time. When Boutique came along, I was doing it part time. Um, and uh, halfway through this year of part-time, I just we would have done it anyway. You know, we would have gone to these whiskey festivals anyway, so we're being paid to travel expenses to get there um, and, and have a weekend of pouring whiskey, meeting friends and having a great time. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and said, how would you like to do this um, full-time, Dave? Nice. And I literally said, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, uh, amazing. Uh, was it hard to give up the shipbuilding career, the engineering side? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was. It was. It was a you know, it was something that I enjoyed doing. The engineering part of it, I did think about it seriously. Um, right. My daughter said, "What are you thinking about it for, Dad? Just go." Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I did think about it because it's a uh, yeah, serious, serious. Do you still kind of dabble with like? Uh, do you get the Lego and the Meccano sets out and have a little go <laughs> now? <laughs> <laughs> a uh, I, I, yeah, I, I still do a lot of s- stuff around the house. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you pull Lego and Ricardo out from? I love that. Because that's what, you know, he's <laughs> building bridges and boats. That's what I used to do as well. Love it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Sam, uh, how about you? you know, it's what parents tell their kids when they play with those toys. Like, well, you're great. You're, <laughs> keep playing with that. One day you'll grow up to be a Dave. <laughs> <laughs> be an engineer, whiskey ambassador, like that boutique guy. Uh, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but I certainly didn't in 2002 when I moved to Edinburgh and that's where I fell in love with whiskey. I, I had no whiskey experience before moving to Scotland in 2002. Um, other than, I mean, I played music too, like you guys, and you know, you play gigs off and someone get you, a, you know, we were on tour across North America after a gig, someone would be like, Hey, great, great show, man. And they, here's a scotch or 
I didn't, I wasn't yeah. nosing it. It wasn't in a Glen Cairn glass. It was just, oh, oh God, yes. iodine. You know? Yes, we know that one. Um, <clears throat> so that's all whiskey was to me uh, until that point. Or Canadian whiskey and ginger ale. That's, mm. that's what we had at home. And yeah, I moved to Edinburgh, went to, uh, I joined a hockey team, like a good Canuck. And I joined a whiskey team, the Edinburgh University Water of Life Society. And it was <laughs> some people sitting around, I think 11 men and one woman. And she was the mascot. And this, these are just facts. Uh, I'm just telling it as it is. Um, she was from Sweden and Swedes love their whiskey. And she was the only female member of this club. And we sat around pinky. So oh, yes. Oh, divine. Oh, notes of apricot. Indeed, James. Yes. But there was a guy, <laughs> there was a guy, James, there who started telling me about whiskey. And I, it wasn't just that wonderful feeling that was coming over me. There was also this whole history of it to do with clearances and people moving out, out of Scotland, being kicked off their land, uh, taxation history, uh, agricultural history. It was really it just, I started getting really into it as a, as a nerd. I um, started reading about it uh, and then eventually writing about it. When I left Edinburgh, I mean, I ran this club for a while and grew it proudly to half women, half men. Um, each meeting of 56 people, no longer 12. And when we uh, we would take people on trips uh, in the whiskey world and just meet whiskey makers. And, and the whiskey world, like Dave said, was so welcoming and so warm. It was strange. It was, it was almost surprising, you know, because whiskey has this association of being exclusive and yeah. um, not inclusive. Uh, and premium and luxury. And it, it, yes, it is all of those things as well, but all the people, the closer you got to the people making the stuff and the world, the asteroid belts of people around it were just warm and welcoming. It was awesome. And I, I wanted more and more and more all the time. So that's, that's, that's where I got the bug. And I started calling myself Dr. Whiskey because I left Edinburgh for London, trying to get work in academia. Uh, and uh, people, uh, my friends started calling me Dr. Whiskey because I was more shooting the shit about whiskey than about what I was researching. <laughs> um, and then I started a blog called that, called Dr. Whiskey. And then that was, it's not that long ago, but it's crazy to think that if you had called your podcast Whiskey Podcast, I guess that would have, you know, 10 years ago, you'd be all number one. Dr. Whiskey in 2006, if, if you Googled anything in the English language, like Glenn, Glenn Livet tasting notes, I came up. It was super visible. So that got me massive traffic and then eventually three job offers within a few months. So that was really crazy. What do you mean? I can talk about whiskey for a living? Yes, please. <laughs> like, like Dave said, you're kidding me, right? You're yeah. going to pay me to what? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then I got to and moved to New York. So we were living in uh, Edinburgh, then London. Then my wife and I moved to New York City, spent a couple of years there. I worked as the Balvenie, Glo uh, the Balvenie ambassador across the US. And then I was invited by the family to come do that uh, back in the UK. And yes, please. And that's where I started working closely with Brian Kinsman and David Stewart, uh, MBE, uh, with sort of stock planning and understanding everything behind the curtain of whiskey. And that was also equally eye-opening. So the journey never stops, does it, guys? No. Yeah, doesn't. I guess not. It's so true about the whiskey world being so welcoming. And, and that's where I was getting to when I said about turning up to your afternoon tea session, because it, was, it, it feels like the whiskey world should be intimidating. Uh, and then to turn up and straight away within a, an online event be so welcomed in was was just so lovely. We've yet to do a real world whiskey event, and I can't wait. I don't know about you, Nick, but I absolutely yeah. cannot wait. Especially seeing as we've got to know a few people and brand ambassadors and and things like that. So, moving on. So you now both work for the Boutique Whiskey Company. So can we just hear a little bit more about that? It's, a, it's an independent bottler known for some crazy labels as well as great whiskey obviously um so can you tell us a little bit more about the history of that company and what you try and specialize in um great whiskey is what we try and specialize in that's definitely what we're interested in we i Perfect. mean the company is just full of nerds of you know <laughs> passionate no not that passionate about great whiskey and the people within um yeah we started in september 2012 uh with our first four releases two from arguably two of scotland's most collectible whiskies, Macallan and Ardbeg, mm -hmm. uh, and then two closed distilleries, Port Ellum and Cappadonic. So that's where we opened our account with. Uh, and, you know, yeah, we're, we're big Scotch whisky fans, um, but we also realised that there's much more than just Scotch. Uh, and we were one of the first independent bottlers, I think, were who went out there and started looking at independently bottling other world whiskies. Our first one was in 2014, was an American bourbon. But we quickly, you know, we did... Australian whiskey, our first ever Australian whiskey back in 2016 with Overeem. Um, and then, yeah, we started, you know, finding these as we're on our travels, pushing our own market out there, you know, putting our own bottles into the market. We're meeting other distillers and, 
oh man, that's incredible what you're doing there. Do you fancy doing something with us? And uh, really, that's how it's snowballed in terms of world whiskey. Um, yeah, we're, we're independent bottlers. We don't make whiskey. Um, I always used to say we don't finish whiskey apart from what's in our glass. Um, <laughs> But we do. I mean, when I first started with Boutique Whiskey, we never even had our own bottling hall. Um, you know, we, we, we never bottled our own. We used other independent bottlers to bottle our own whiskey because if you're bottling scotch, it has to be distilled, matured, and bottled in Scotland. Uh, you know, head office is in Kent, so there's can't bottle it down there. You've got to <laughs> use somebody else to bottle your your product. And that's all changed. We've got a bottling plant. And yeah, for a little while, we had a bottleneck in the bottling plant. That's a really lovely pun to get in there because it, <laughs> it, it did happen. Um, but yeah, we've got our own bottling plant and we can, I think when we first opened it, we never even had a license to store whiskey. We never had a bonded warehouse, did we, Sam, when we first opened. We can only keep casks on for like 24 hours or something that we had to bottle. Um, we had to bring them in and bottle them. So it was a little bit of a logistical nightmare, but we have that licensing in hand now and we can do our own things and obviously we do finishing but not ordinarily in boutique boutique we're seeking out either collaborations with new distilleries or finding those parcels of scotch whiskey in bonders um private cask owners uh, a lot of private cask owners uh, we bought a lot of older scotch from um, and now, you know, those doors with distilleries are starting to open up from us as well because, um, you know, we've been in, been around for a little while and um, we don't tend to release, well, we don't really, I mean, I don't think any independent bottle of these days releases any rubbish, you know, they believe yeah. in, in, in what we're releasing. Yeah. Well, I didn't even register the fact that, yes, the scotch has to be bottled in Scotland. So I'm guessing that's the same for your bourbons, your English whiskies, your Irish, your Japanese. Is it the same? Not at the moment, no. Only Scotland is tied up with the most ah. legislation like that. Okay. You know, it does, you know, American whiskey doesn't have to be matured in America, from what I remember. I mean, because there's, there's a bourbon floating around the sea, isn't there? They've got some offshore. I think Jefferson have got the ocean bourbon, which is maturing on a ship. Um, yeah, you can, you can, it can be continental age, much like rum. A lot of rum was continental age, if you go back in the rum history. I mean, it's just fortunate that Scotland was on our doorstep um, and, and the West Indies weren't on our doorstep. And so, that, you know, <laughs> rum was being shipped over to the UK and maturing in the UK, whereas the whiskey was maturing in warehouses in Scotland and in England. And, you know, there was whiskey maturing everywhere for a little while until um, the SWA bought in that. It wasn't that long ago, was it, when uh, Scotland had to be matured and bottled in scotland it really wasn't that long ago and there was an amnesty um you know because there were casks in private collections in basements in london in basements right. in, in you know there were private collections of cask whiskey not bottled whiskey and there was this amnesty that they could get casks back so they could still call it scotch whiskey i have heard of some whiskies in london basement in casks that can no longer be called scotch but it's wow. you know, if, if it was it would be very very valuable but um yeah, that's mad. Whiskey, as you said, you've you've done a lot of world whiskey stuff. So, who gets that job of travelling round mm. and choosing the casks? Because that sounds like a fun job. Sam, is that you? Unfortunately, not. No. So, I, but it's worth saying because Dave was talking about boutique. So, Dave works on boutique. I work across all the different whiskeys in Adam. Right. Um, so that that's a bit of the difference there. Although I don't get you right, I don't get the pleasure of um, seeking out the cast. We have uh, Toby Cutler, our head buyer, and Felix Deer, who did the work for the Australia series, for example, um, who built the relationships or already had relationships with Australian distillers. Went down there, spent several weeks staying on their couches and in their houses of these distillers, and spending the days in their warehouses, and sometimes even working in the distilleries, um, building relationships with these people, um, which is amazing and he can do that very well because he secured some sexy liquid for us no <laughs> that's not my job um but i fell in love with boutique from the outside i mean i saw those labels when i worked at balveni and just as a whiskey nerd and they were just you needed to know more didn't you you were like what the hell is that you always want to like bring it close to look yeah, at they it are that, very engaging yeah that, it's engaging that kind of thing so if we try to do that with all the whiskeys we make but it's there's a lot of room for crazy f***ing around in the world of whiskey, even so, within even within the regulations, like Dave's saying, with those labels, which are so, in my opinion, iconic to the brand, do you have just one artist, or do you use different artists for different projects, or how does that work? And who gets the final say in that as well? Because that's got to mm -hmm. be for a, 
a, a brand which really lives by the label in many regards on top of the whiskey, obviously, but the label is such a key part of the brand. The final decision on those labels has got to be a big part of the conversation, right? Yeah, uh, it is these days. We have a, yeah, we have a boutique label. Like we, we all talk about the labels now. Before it really came out of a few people's heads. Um, certainly, right at the beginning, it was Ben's ideas. Uh, ben Elfson, director at Master of Malt, um, it was his brainchild really to have this independent bottling company but yeah we've worked with one artist right from the beginning emily chapel nice. is her name she's a freelance illustrator uh, originally from manchester lives in glasgow she nails every damn label almost instantly these times i think if she doesn't nail it it's because we've messed up um, <laughs> yeah she, she's in our heads now we give her an idea and she comes back with a sketch and and then it's pencil sketch freehand sketch starts off with then it's digitized and then colored in um, and brought to life. Certainly with a lot of these new distilleries, certainly with our Australia series, we wanted to tell the stories of each of these distillers. We wanted them to become part of the labels. And um, yeah, we, we tried to do that with every one of the labels. The distillers, the, the distillers, the families behind the distilleries have been involved with the labels to tell us stories that we'd put into a picture um, and then send it back to them and said, happy with that. Oh bloody love it! You know that sort of thing. You know, it's um, I'm just seeing some pictures of the distillers with with their labels, and they're, yeah, just looking pleased as punch. Yeah, so they did have a say in some of the labels as well. Sometimes, certainly when we're working with new distillers, um, you know, new world distillers, they definitely have a play a part in telling us the stories of what they'd like to see on the label, or we have an idea and we put it to them. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, we like that. Or can we just make him look a bit like this? Or can we bring David in? Or can we bring, you know, um, Nick alongside there? Because Nick should be on it as well, because um, he plays a, an important part in the warehouse. Of, you know, he's bringing those sort of people into the label that they can tell the story as well when they've got it in front yeah. of them. Mm. So we're obviously going to talk a little bit about it, and you already have mentioned it a few times, this Australian range. But my understanding is it's, it's pretty much sold out, correct? It, it is, yeah. I mean, we, there are a couple of bottles left on our um, parents' website. There's just a, um, two two lines, but yeah, there most of it sold out. And I looked at a few other retailers that uh, our distributor had put them into Maverick Drinks, and yeah, they sold out. They went on the, the the whiskey shop online, and they sold out over the bank holiday weekend. And they've been asking for more. Um, there's very little left. I mean, it, it went much quicker than we expected. I must admit. I mean, we knew we had some cracking whiskies, but didn't expect it to. Um, fly I think off even the shop. even when we started this plan, Dave, I don't think people in the whiskey nerd universe were talking uh, outside of Australia. Were talking as much about Australia as they did over the the the, the six months that followed, or the twelve months even before we finally put the whiskey in glass. So I think it was we were a, a few steps ahead. Felix was. In, in even pursuing these casks. And then by the time we got them in glass, there was there was so much chat about the world of whiskey and it's a smaller world. And look at Australia and Archie Rose and all these things that were, the Star, Star Word, all these names that were becoming for the first time uh, available outside of Australia. Um, so the geeks, and we are a small community, but we are spread across the whole globe. Um, we're talking about it. So I think that's part of why. And then Boutique is Boutique, right? How some of these casts, Dave, they yielded like 85 bottles. Um, yeah, so there were, there was, it's quite a small batch. Yeah, that you're right. I think our biggest batch was like 475 bottles, um, 443 bottles. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, they're quite small batches. Yeah. So what then becomes the plan when, when you have a range like this, which sells out so quickly, are you now trying to do another Australian one as soon as possible or are you looking to other regions be it New Zealand perhaps uh, India it maybe even a whole Welsh range have you done that before maybe you've done that already but you know there's so, so many different areas and I've, I've heard Sam say that he feels it's the golden age of world whiskey as well so or whiskey in general because of how much is going on with world whiskies so what is next do you stick with Australia or do you twist Oh, we're definitely, we're, we've got a plan. Okay, there is a plan, um, and it goes out quite a long way, to be honest, because there's a lot of work to be done in getting mm. whiskey samples, uh, deciding what we're going to do. You know, the, okay, you so say we want Australian whiskey. Well, first you've got to send someone out to Australia uh, and get a load of samples, uh, you know, talk to all the distillers to see who's going to be working with you, get the samples, get the car samples, decide what you want. All of that stuff's got to go ahead design all the labels. So that's a long plan. Um, and then we've got to get it back out everywhere so we can have a global launch at the same day without mm. it all going 
and, and taking time to get different places. So yeah, we've held on to it for a little while. Um, but yeah, there is a plan. We're working on the next series uh, release already. Um, it's not an Australian. It's a little bit closer to home. It's a lineup of nine whiskies, I think it was. We went there, yeah, nine whiskies and some rums, all with the same theme this, um, running through it. So yeah, it's not necessarily one country, but there will be themed releases. So our first themed release was World Whiskey. Our second themed release was Rye Whiskey. Uh, and this time we went for one country, Australia, because, you know, we knew what we were talking about in, you know, in terms of Australian whiskey being worth talking about, basically. Mm. Um, yeah. Nobody being able to get any. <laughs> yeah. Well, whiskey, whiskey is worth planning and we do need to plan. I mean, like Dave said, we've only done this three times. Before that, and I hope my boss is listening, the way Boutique was done was haphazard and crazy. It was like, oh, we have cast, get it in, get it in glass. Hopefully someone will buy it. And that's that's great, but you can't do anything. You can't push the conversation forward or be part of innovation or trying new shit. And I'm, I'm we're whiskey nerds. We want to be doing that and constantly discovering. So we needed to start having a bit of a plan and an outturn and doing things a bit more in a controlled manner, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think it's worked. I think it's, it makes it way more fun for us. Can we, cause we're looking ahead and we're looking all over the world and trying to navigate what's next and where else, where else is something interesting going to come from? Cause it is, it is an amazing time in whiskey history. The fact that everyone, every country that drinks malt whiskey, rye whiskey, bourbon style corn whiskey is now making the equivalent locally, which is just amazing. Mm. I'm mm -hmm. guessing as well with some of the distillers you're working with, they might be smaller than, you know, especially the Belgrove one we got here. I've seen the the setup he's got going on there. So I'm guessing you might have had to start quite far ahead of the bottling to kind of get this stock together, I'm guessing. Is that right? Yeah, that's part of it. But the other crazy thing is they, the people um, that we worked with on these whiskeys, the distillers, almost all of them had heard of Boutique in Australia as distillers. And that's flattering. But for a small, pretty small brand, that's, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And then it's worth adding the layer that they can sell everything they make, these small craft Australian distilleries, for example, locally. They don't need to be exported to California and deal with a three-tier system in America. They're fine, thank you very much. And in fact, their frontier isn't the States. It's Southeast Asia, yeah. way bigger market yeah. and way more future safe. It's a growing market. So why would they waste time going to the States? You know, so it, their products, handmade, craft, you've, you've seen Peter set up. Um, it's a part of the agricultural process in the year and, and it's expensive. It's an expensive thing to produce on a small scale. And I think we've been artificially taught, although it sounds crazy to say uh, that whiskey can be cheap because Scotch whiskeys, blended Scotches and most entry level malts are quite mm. cheap for what they are. And so craft whiskeys are, are expensive. So they can't, they're prohibitive to even leave. So they don't need us. It's not like they need Boutique to come get casks. So that, that's another cool thing about this whole series is that it is a partnership and it's something that we both wanted to do together. It took two to tango for sure. You talked about um, the idea of the conversation needing to happen around your releases and things like that. Is that one of the reasons why you set up the Uncorked podcast? So you, you can actually have those conversations as well in a fun way with the people making these. Because you've been talking about Australian whiskies on that for quite a while. You've been planting that seed that this Australian thing was going for a while. So obviously you know what's coming up. And the same you did the same thing with rye whiskey. So, you know, you, you were planting the seed of, oh, we need to explore rye. We need to talk to people about rye. And then suddenly there's a boutique rye range. Perfect. But the conversation has been interesting, regardless of whether you were going to release those whiskeys. Don't so there's planning involved there. I, I, oh, really? It's giving us way too much credit. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember when we were, what we're going to talk about next week, Dave, you said, didn't you? I can't remember what we were talking about. Uh, we did the Irish one, wasn't it, with Charlie? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. What are we going to talk about next week? Well, let's talk about American whiskey. Yeah, that's so great. We'll talk about American whiskey next week. And I went home thinking, I'm sitting on the train thinking, I don't know anything about American whiskey. I have <laughs> no idea where American whiskey started and, and, and finished. I didn't, you know, I'd, we'd all heard of prohibition, but we didn't nearly, really know what it meant. I had no idea what it meant and how long it, you know, it closed everything down until I had to go delving into... Uh, into the history books and starting, wow, really? That much? Shit. You closed down everything. You granted 10 licenses and it's just, yeah, mind-blowing when you think of how many distilleries there were. And the same with, you know, I'd, I'd known about Australian whiskey, 
uh, you know, I was introduced to Australian whisky a long, long time ago um, as a whisky blogger um, by Dominic Roscoe. I mean, Dominic has been waving that Australian flag for years. Um, when Sullivan's Cove won the world's best whiskey in 2004, mm. world's best single malt or world's best whiskey in 2014. And no one could get hold of the bloody stuff because it was a single cask. It had all gone by the time it had been voted the world's best whiskey. And we couldn't get hold of any Australian, but I didn't know anything about Australian whiskey history. You know, it started in 1992, as far as I was, con- you, know, every, you know, everywhere you read, first distillery license in Australia for 152 years. And you're thinking, that can't be true, you know, because I worked with Australians out in the Far East. And, you know, they knew how to drink. So they knew how to drink. You know? <laughs> and, you know, sure enough, there were, you know, okay, it was rum back then, but um, they, they knew how to drink. So they must have had a distilling history. So yeah, you go and look into those things and think, okay, we can tell a story here because there was a huge Australian whiskey history that sort of died a death and then rebirth. And this is the rebirth of the Australian whiskey history that we're seeing now. Yeah. I don't think the podcast, man, I don't, I don't think the podcast or anything we've done are part of some master plan. In fact, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably instead it's that, you know, if you get bored of whiskey, you're probably bored of life, that sort of thing. You're bored of New York or you're bored of London, you're bored of life, that sort of thing. Because Dave and I are always trying to learn more. We're geeks like you too. I think no matter what level you're at, how long you've been into whiskey, that same appetite that you had a year ago, that pursuit of knowledge and how can I learn more? You set up a podcast to try and learn more. We met with a guy in Australia who had a podcast. He set his up, Drinks Adventures, to to learn more. And and I think ours is the same. It drove our uh, never-ending pursuit of more whiskey knowledge. And so I think it ended up with a rye series because we were reading about it. We were meeting people. We were calling people from rye distilleries across the world. Uh, we and It ended up in an Australia series because we were looking there and saying, holy shit, let's explore more just as, as drinkers, not as mm. I don't know, whiskey makers. Uh, and then the happens to be the other one pays for our shoes. So we need to get that organized pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> whiskey bots roll out. So it, it's funny that, that we, we obviously we talk about mine and Nick's journey being doing this for a year. Episode one, Nick happened to be in New Zealand uh, and was went to a whiskey shop. The What was it called? The New Zealand Whiskey Collection in Omaru, stuff from Dundin. Nick turned yeah. up saying, I've got a whiskey podcast, which was kind of true. We'd planned on having a whiskey podcast. So set up some fancy looking stuff and said, can I interview you? And this guy was great, but assumed that Nick had a certain level of knowledge <laughs> and started talking about Tasmanian whiskey and things like that. And Nick's like, hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you do when you, you're trying to impress someone and uh, he gets back, <laughs> plays me this interview and I'm like, Tasmanian whiskey? What are you on about? Like, I've never heard of that. It's been a long, <laughs> a long <laughs> journey since then. <laughs> To finally get some in a glass. Yeah. I've actually in front got, of the I've, got the, I've got the clip here, Dave. Oh, have you now? Yeah. Tasmanian whiskey. What's that about? I'd never heard of Tasmanian whiskey. Didn't even whiskey. know that was a thing. And you stood there and you agreed. Oh, yeah. Mm. No, I, I was like, oh, yeah. No, you didn't. I, you agreed because oh, no, you wanted I went, to make yourself look like an oh, expert. Yeah. <laughs> I never said I was an expert. Uh, I bet he knew you were lying. I bet he knew you were lying. Was, I wasn't lying. I grew up. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, I didn't know about Tasmanian whiskey, but now I do, and now I want to find out more about it. And we should do a Tasmanian whiskey at some point on the show. Okay. We should find one. Do they sell that in Waitrose? Well, I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> the whiskey shop in Mayfair will probably be able to find a lovely cheap bottle. All right, we're both um, chipping in for that one. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah. And there we are, episode 60. We finally have Tasmanian whiskey in our glass, Nick. How about that? <laughs> but, man, there's nothing more genuine than that. It's something charming about the podcast, too, is that you're not afraid to not know. Yeah. And that's okay. We all, all whiskey people are open minded and like fallible. We're trying to find out the next thing. And yeah, you mm. show up with two seven Bs. Someone says, okay, he's got 700 pounds for <laughs> those two microphones, but he knows nothing. Cool. I can't wait to tell him. And I can, and you can't wait to learn. That's the whole reciprocal relationship that whiskey gives us. I think that's, that is the right spirit of whiskey, guys. No, oh, absolutely. Obviously, I've been hunting Tasmanian whiskey and I've had people promise they were going to send me some and all this kind of stuff. So when this Australian release came on, it was perfectly timed for Nick's birthday. I was like, yes, yes, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And I was there on, on release day, frantically making sure I, I got the bottle. Uh, and said Dave, send it. There are two, Dave. Which one should I get? Which one should I get? <laughs> uh, so it, it was. It's it's great to finally have one uh, and to be and to be trying it. And Nick, I don't know how much of you've had while we've been drinking this, but it's 
It's really good. Uh, oh, it is beautiful. No, I had a bit the other day because obviously I had to take uh, some. Of course, cause, you did. Cause Dave, Dave, I got it in the post, and Dave was like, "Open it, open it, open it." I was like, "Well, it's a birthday present. It wasn't for another few days." He's like, "Open it, open it, open it." And I got it out, and he's like, "And the card read." <laughs> I have that here. <laughs> Happy birthday. Make sure you send me a sample before we get the boutique guys on. So, <laughs> it reminded right. me when I was a teenager, my brother bought me Nevermind by and Nirvana. And he taped it. And, and he, he taped, taped it. it before he gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's quite funny because I was going to get it sent to my address, take a sample myself, and then send it to you. Wow. But I thought, I thought, do you know what? It's best to get it to get him to send me the sample. Otherwise, it is exactly that. So, yeah. uh, but yes, it's, this is uh, what we're drinking here. Is uh, we mentioned it earlier? It's from the Belgrove Distillery, uh, and I heard you guys talk about this place in a podcast last year. But this is a special place. So this is a rye as well. Did they only do rye at Belgrove? Is that they were the first a rye distillery in Australia? Yeah, that's what he grew. That's what the crop right. he grows to sell and to feed his sheep. <laughs> um, you know, he's is, is a farmer, and um, yeah, the story goes is that he had a bumper crop of rye one year. I mean, huge crop. Never seen anything like it, and thought, ah, I'm gonna make some dollars here, sell all this, I'll be be in for. A, um, and of course, everybody else had a bumper crop that year. You know, one farm has a bumper crop. It's right across the area. Everybody had a bumper crop of rye. So he had all this rye. The price of rye went down. He said, what am I going to do with it all now? Uh, and then he went to speak with his pal, Bill Lark, the godfather of Australian whiskey, and said, "Could I? can I distill it? And uh, yeah, that's where it all started. This guy built a distillery in his farm. I mean, it, it is, as yeah. I think I did the whiskey tasting with the with Australia last two weeks ago just before we launched we did it sam and i, I wanted to start with the belgrove because a, it's one of my favorites um and you know everyone knows i love a rye whiskey but it is just so far out there but it also is it, it is where whiskey began it's a farm making whiskey and you know it, <laughs> i accidentally put it in first place and sam pointed it out um i what no credit for being i just put it in first place because a it was a little bit out there it's rye but yeah it's it's a farm that turned to a distillery and he built everything himself you know yeah. he, he's just a, a one-man band passionate about what he's doing yeah he's bringing in other people now to run the farm you know whiskey has taken over his life and he yeah he's looking at other grains now um but yeah he's looking at other grains only because he's learned so much with the rye and uh well, I feel like I'm growing barley here. Well, why can't I do it with that? What, why can't I do it with a bit of corn? You know, I need some barley to get it going. So let's let's do that. Um, yeah. So yeah, he he is experimenting with other stuff now. But yes, it was all about the rye, how he started, which is what we wanted this rye in the series. And and he's just such a cracking character. Yeah. Um, I was watching earlier on the uh, the Gordon Ramsay show, which he was on. <laughs> It's, it's ridiculous. Absolutely yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> um, actually, looking at the bottle, um, stuff Emily's put on this lovely label, it's, a bit of, it's like a flow diagram of things which are involved <laughs> to make this whiskey. I thought it would be right. nice if you guys could just explain a few of these. Obviously, we have the first box, which is Belgrove Farm Rye. Then it moves on to Tumble Dryer. What's the story there? Yeah, he's got... Um industrial um laundrette tum tumble driver that he's hit tumble dryer that he's converted into the malting drum basically um so that's the tumble dryer is his malting drum so he can malt the rye turning it like a it's like a big drum maltings effectively yeah it's a big rusty old dryer as well from what i saw well it's outside yeah. in the back of the shed isn't it I know. <laughs> works fine <laughs> next one meat mincer ah uh, yeah well this is this uh, a meat mincer is um it's porteous mill effectively right um yeah so that's his portius mill and um, they don't make them anymore um yeah next one's interesting industrial sewage separator yes of course you every distillery essential. needs one of them yes. yeah an essential piece of equipment that people have missed out in the rest of the world um peter assured uh, felix when felix was talking assured him it was a new industrial <laughs> sewage yeah. separator but yeah that's that's the sort of the mash tun sort of um right. equipment yeah right, separate right, right. the the, the work from the from the draft, yeah. Yeah. Hand built still is the next one. This is really ah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, he made his own stills from scrap copper and um yeah, everything. You know, the whole flow chart thing was that really something to do with one thing coming in to the farm, mm. which is used chip oil. 
and one thing yeah. leaving the farm, which is whiskey. Mm. That's yeah. you know, the whole flow chart. But yeah, yeah, he built his own stills, um, scrap copper. Yeah. The spirit of that, even this, that's crazy, isn't it? Like this guy, yeah. yes, he's a farmer, he's resourceful. He's not trying to make it difficult for himself, but he takes such joy, I think, in solving it, in, in seeing what the problem is and fixing it, or, or the physical ownership or the pride that comes with, I guess, hammering your own still or finding your own solution, you know, and that sort yeah. of spirit is, I don't know, it's, it's just inspiring, I think, just as a, as a human, and never mind as a distiller. Yeah, <laughs> it's all kind of self-sustainable as well. Obviously, the draft goes back to feed the sheep, you know, and as well with this whiskey, was the, uh, sorry, was the rye dried using a peat, or was it something else he has on the farm? I have no idea. Dear, I, I, mean, I think it's all. Yeah, he has been using. Has it? Bill had been using some. He had been using some sheep gun, wasn't he? And he was using some seaweed recently. Okay, oh, nice. yeah, seaweed too. That's right. Yeah, I, I don't think this one was either. Of those, no, I don't though. think this one is. No, this one has just been dried, and I think that's the chip right. oil. Chip oil drying the, uh, the the soggy malt. Yeah, cool. Nice. <laughs> like that too, right? <laughs> Just, it's not like he was he's pursuing something ridiculous. It's that it was available and it will do the job. And yeah. it's my fingerprint. I mean, it's not my fingerprint. It's his. I think yeah. it's cool. I mean, so they do wow. it in Iceland. And I haven't tried yes. that one yet. Floki. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure that's great. But yeah, it's amazing. It's unlike any rye I've ever tasted. It's, it's unlike any drink, isn't it? It's, I mean, yeah. that's. The, I think the, the, the cast we selected for this it shows the breadth, the flavor, first of all, of Australian whiskey, but also that... There's so much more yet to be done with whiskey. Like, yeah, mm. Scotland's obviously shown us beautiful whiskey, some of the greatest whiskeys the world's ever produced, for sure. Um, America, too. And even if I can humbly add Canada. But really, the, the, we're just scratching the surface, I think. There's so much more that maybe maybe it was more common back in the day that things tasted a bit more inconsistent or all over the place or unrepeatable. But a bit of that spirit's coming back in the craft distilleries around the world. And you definitely taste and knows that in these whiskeys. There's just, it's peerless. There's no comparison to that yeah. drink. And that's special. To me, this when you first know it, it reminds me of sort of a tequila mezcal, that pepperiness coming through. It really does. I mean, it's just taking me out to, to Mexico again at the moment. And again, it's, oh it's really coming through in droves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. I'd not noticed that, but that's so true. First thing I noticed on the nose was uh, menthol airwaves. Um, and lemon. For you foreigners listening, that's a local bubblegum flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, man that tequila thing is so yeah. true I, that, that's absolutely crazy earthy yeah earthy mm. smoky mezcali sort of note to it that peppery note on the palate that's mm. just still that, that on the back of that palate that really black pepper coming through is that sort of tequila definitely sort of thing coming through that that but i mean it's got that barbecue pineapple on there for me and on the nose mm. Yeah, lemon and honey and that chocolatey yep. note that comes through on the palate later, really sort of milky chocolate. Mm. I'm still getting that kind of rye pickle and dill kind of thing mm -hmm. as well, which I get from, you know, the more American ryes. Yeah. And every now and then I am getting the chip oil. I know that sounds stupid, but every now and then I get, I don't know if it's because I'm aware of it, of, of that it's been used, but it, it does every now and then I'm like, oh, is that the chip oil? Is that why I'm tasting there? But there's something in there which is a little bit... Uh, I'm getting tea tree oil as mm. well. Interesting. And they're like this old kind of herbal soaps. Herbal, it's, yeah. It's gorgeous. It's so, so nice. Really is. It's beautifully balanced, isn't it? I mean, for nearly 50% ABV, it's just beautifully balanced. It's yeah. so, so sippable. Yeah. It's, it, that's exactly what I was just thinking as well. It doesn't feel like that at all. Yeah. Um, and it's wonderful. quite young, four years. So I'm guessing the climate down there is uh, helping that age quite quickly. I, I think rye comes to its best young. Uh, when, you, when you, I'm certainly talking to some rye distillers recently with the rye series, you know, rye comes across much better at a younger spirit. All the ryes that we used, uh, we released uh, a little while ago, were from 11 months to four or five years as well. I don't think we had any old ryes. It was all quite a young rye um, releases from the distilleries. Right. Do you know what casks these were matured in? Uh, this is from an ex-Australian um, whiskey, yeah, American oak, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a repurposed uh, Australian whiskey. He thinks it came from, where did he think it came from? He, so he did suspect it was Sullivan's Cove, is what the note here says. Recharge ex-Tasmanian whiskey cask. 
What do you see at Sullivan's Cove? That was the name I was looking for. Yes. You're listening to Whiskey and Things. So you mentioned a name, and I, I want to go back to this because this guy's story is amazing. So Dave Lark, the godfather of Australian whiskey. Bill Lark, wasn't it? Bill, Bill Lark. Well, it was Bill you Lark. Dave's Sorry, so many Dave. All you Dave's. Yeah, yeah, yeah you just want everyone to be, to be a called Dave. Dave. It just makes life so much easier if we're all called Dave. <laughs> Right, so this Dave Lark guy. Um, <laughs> Nick and Sam are out. Yeah. <laughs> um, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was some loads, similar to Scotland, there was quite a lot of rules about what could be distilled and how long something had to be distilled. And it was to do with the amount uh, your still could hold. So it was, was it 50 litres or something like that? And, and you couldn't distill something in Australia unless you had a still that could contain 50 litres, making that a number up. But he changed the rules to get them to slim it down to five so that we could essentially start having, or smaller than that, so that you could essentially start distilling whiskey at a much smaller level, which is, is why we've now got this huge growth in uh, craft distilling in Australia. And there's now, what, hundreds of distilleries out there doing, doing stuff when there used to be like single digits within the last 20 years or something. I, yeah. I'm, I'm summarising without notes, but I, I think I'm roughly in the ballpark was, of what was going on here, right? There, there was a still thing. There was a still size thing going on in Australia. There was also an excise thing going on in Australia, is that you had to house the, the excise officers, just like you did in Scotland many, many years ago. Uh, every distillery had a little house for the excise men and their wow. own offices, and you had the excise men living on the distillery. You had the same sort of thing in the rules in Australia, and that changed in the in the late eighties, early nineties. That the rules were starting to change, um, and and then Bill Lark sort of challenged the still size, and it was it was it was it wasn't quite as small as the size as you were saying. That was a little bit bigger. I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, it was fifteen hundred liters or something right. smaller still. <laughs> I was way out. <laughs> you wouldn't get much new make out of that out of five. But I got his, at least I got his name right. <laughs> 500 to 50, exactly. The ratio was there. The ratio was there. That's all, all that matters, the ratios. <laughs> you had the right numbers in the ratios. But, um, yeah, he, that the law was changing, and, um, yeah, Bill drove it home that, um, yeah, drove or guided legislation to allow... Uh, Australian distilling to start again in a, in a small scale. Yeah. Very much like, um, I guess, over here in, 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 in England with the English whiskey company sort of taking the license by the letter and, and driving it home and really opening that door to a lot of English whiskey companies coming on board from a, a little bit later. You know, Bill started a lot earlier in 92, but, you know, it's taking its time to rumble along and grow. Um, you know, now distilling in, in in australia is is huge i mean yeah it is huge and there's lots of little outlets the same thing happened here did it dave i didn't realize that yeah the, the, the english whiskey company chat you know the original idea for the english whiskey company with james nelstrop was just to have a little distillery um because he was a farmer grew his own crops and you know the best barley came from east, east of england and he only wanted a little garage distillery but they followed the rules about the sizes of the stills and they ended up with a commercial distillery which was sort of the beginning of this challenge where we can do smaller you know you can why does it have to be this you know why can't we have this commercial and that was really the, the gateway there. Yeah, it's the big companies holding the little guy down. Like you, that's your theory about what happened in Australia. It certainly happened when, what happened in Canada. So we have the same thing that these two guys in Ontario, anyway, in that province, pushed the laws to have a minimum size because it's, it's prohibitive to take a risk on distilling spirits at fifteen hundred or more uh, liters per per batch. That's that's a lot of risk. Mm. And so to change those, and then they're put in place by the big companies to keep competition at bay. Yeah, and eventually that cracks, and we have craft distilling all over the world. Yeah, which is why, as you say, it's the gold golden era. And I love, I love, I quote you on that all the time, Sam. I'm, I hope I'm not misquoting you, but I always say, Sam Simmons, Doctor Whiskey says it's the golden age of whiskey right now. <laughs> I, I say that quite a lot because it, it, it certainly feels that way. In the year that we've been learning about this, or over a year now, that there there are so many whiskies coming from so many regions in so many small places that are, you know. Bimbers just down the road, and what they're doing is crazy from a from an industrial warehouse, which is yeah. tiny, 
and 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 how much column inches they're getting just from from that and how many sales they're getting is crazy so do you think that this rise in craft distilling and therefore some of those brands becoming slightly bigger is going to affect the scotch industry in terms of are Scotland gonna gonna turn around and go? We have to be careful that we're gonna, not going to get left behind here. Scotch does not make rush decisions, and I think that's uh, going to be a real benefit through a time like this because I don't think we're sure that Bimber's a success yet. Yeah, that's a good point. It, and I don't mean to pick on Bimber, but you just because you mentioned it, Bimber, their product, their their, their releases sell out. You're right. There's a lot of distillers around the world, small local distillers, and locally they sell out, but. Are they getting purchased the second time? There's many retailers, friends of mine around the world who have a theory that they haven't sold a single bottle till they sold two right. to the same person. Um, and I think that's a good rationale to have it, whether or not a product you brought in is successful or not. Mm. And I see on the secondary market loaded with Bimber, for example, loaded with first release Nicknean. So if no one's drinking it, it's not going to work. Yeah. Unfortunately, if people are just putting it on their shelves, will that last? And Scotch whiskey, Bowmore, Black Bowmore, people drank it. That's why it became so precious because most of it was gone in people's bellies. Special release. There's many examples, you know. And I think if it's if there's not a high desire to drink, uh, it's not a, it's not going to be successful in the long game. So I, Scotch is slow to change, slow to pivot, and that's what makes it so special. Why it has endured all this time. I hope it doesn't suddenly shift to say, okay, let's use any kind of barrel. It, let's let's reduce the minimum aging because then the things that make scotch scotch are at risk. Mm. Um, I, and I don't think that would happen. So I think that the bigger question is, is this rise and rise of craft going to continue? Mm. What do you guys think? I don't know. I mean, I've t- I've I have bought two different bottles of Bimba and I've drunk both of them. But we joined the club, didn't we? Well done. We're, we're Brilliant. Kind yeah. of, you know. So okay. And Nick Neen, we. Uh, I love that spirit and I can't wait for their next. So the two examples you've given, I have drunk both of them. Um, but mm. I, I see your point that you do see them on the secondary market and are they just, have they just got their marketing so spot on at the moment that they're becoming a, a, a product which people think is an investment, which is dangerous because actually you're right. It needs to become an investment because people want to drink it, not mm-hmm. because it's scarce. So that's, yeah, that's certainly an, an interesting, interesting point. But as, as an indem- independent bottlers, I find that what you do inherently crazy because you release small things once and then you move on. And that's a really crazy business plan. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's what you get in the whiskey world. And it's one of the, the, the independent bottling thing, which again, I didn't even know about a year ago. It's so crazy for that very reason. You know, it's a, you are getting something unique once. And if you like it, it's not about, oh, I can buy another bottle of that. It's about building trust in the bottler, in the brand. Okay, Boutique, I love what they've done before. I'm going to try. I may not have heard of Australian whiskey, but they've just released an Australian series. I'm going to go for it. And and do you see repeat names? I don't know if you get a manifest of who orders things, but but or do you see repeat names or, or people in your social media that pop up again and again saying, I bought one of everything because I, I, for that very reason or not? We've got a really lovely fan base that love what we do, uh, absolutely. Um, and they do buy us on trust. Well, yeah. you know, uh, boutique. I mean, that's what every independent bottler and blender want to do. That's, you know, that... that that trust you need to create. I remember talking to someone a long, long time ago when Compass Box were, were starting. You know, you, they, you sample everything from Compass Box. And as soon as you've tasted just about everything they've been doing, is it, yeah, I trust what Compass Box are doing. I don't need to taste it before I buy it because I mm. know it's going to be good. Um, you know, because they were putting their heart and their soul into every blend that they put out there. Yeah, it's the same with, you know, we, we don't want to put anything duff out there because everyone will remember when you put something shit out. No one will remember when you put something good out. Yeah, be, you know, it'll be when, when you make a big, big cock up, yeah, you will know about it Absolutely. forever. That's why we're sitting on six casts of Soapy Altmar. Because <laughs> we cannot put that in a bottle. If anyone likes Soapy Whiskey, give me a call. <laughs> That, that boutique soap company. Eventually. <laughs> I feel bad for saying this tastes or smells like herbal soap earlier now. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lovely smell. And so You're listening to the Whiskey and Things podcast. So finally, um, obviously this week is, there's World Whiskey Day this week and you're hosting uh, the World Whiskey Summit on Saturday, May the 15th, which uh, this podcast comes out on the Wednesday. So you've got a few days before that. So 
What can people expect from that and uh, and how people could log on to that if they want to get involved? Well, look, there's no no ticket fee. We did this last year. It was the beginning of lockdown, really, and we were kind of lonely. We missed seeing people. Mm. We, we missed Spirit of Space Side. We missed the face shield. Um, it was a massive adjustment. I'm sure it still it still is. Um, and we're we're more used to it now, of course. But we so we gathered people last year for this World Whiskey Summit. It was crazy. It was online, live, like Muppet Show, a bunch of different heads trying to find five minutes to get a few words in. It was um it was crazy. And we were still in the early days of the podcast, too. So sort of what we get up to creatively was still um new. But we we knew that we wanted to do it again this year. But how, without you know, taking everyone's Saturday night, especially now that we're allowed to go out, you know, mm-hmm. I think last year it was weird. You know, you usually invite people to a party or to take part in an event or something like this, and you get sixty percent say, "Unfortunately, sorry, I can't." You get thirty percent success rate. Let's say everyone said yes last year because everyone was stuck at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we don't want we don't want to count on that this year. We didn't want to get everyone online to sit on, sit on a call for two hours to speak for five minutes. So we pre recorded. 30 people from around the world, like Richard Patterson, uh, people from Diageo, Lynette Marrero, Lauren Moat, uh, Becky Paskin, Nick Morgan, uh, Lisa Trusco from Archie Rose Distiller at Archie Rose in Australia, people from Sydney to Seattle, um, distillers, bartenders, whiskey nerds, uh, just to talk about this kind of shit that we all talk about, it's things you talk about on the podcast. I know I've listened recently uh, you have Julie Hamilton or whoever you have on recently. There's there's so many themes that keep coming up, whether it's craft or about loyalty or about the, the wake of COVID. And so we're getting them all on to play silly games, talk serious chat, but also get a bit silly together in the fun of whiskey. Yeah. Is it interactive? For people who watch, can they uh, ask questions, et cetera? There will be a live component. So we'll be sat there live, but we'll be sharing the pre-recorded sort of interviews or talking heads, more like a documentary. You know, look, we've been mm-hmm. watching these things all year and some of them, even my favorite uh, whiskey presenters, they just get dull. You know, <laughs> watching someone else go, I'm getting marzipan. Oh, no, no, is that Martin? No, maybe it's just fresh almond. Good point. Tom. Who the fuck cares? You know, so we want to create something I want to watch. And I watch music documentaries. Yeah. And a music yeah. documentary, they'll have a talking head say, well, Dylan was really high at the time. Well, Dylan wasn't taking drugs at the time. Well, I was that Dylan's gay lover and he was fucking wasted. Whatever the... <laughs> having these people give insight that's so exciting and so we're getting yeah. these voices from all over the whiskey world and then we have five people um white men with beards who are going to join us on the evening uh to talk shit and share the the underheard opinion of the white men and beards get a, some diverse voices <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll have music video um and uh, dave's uh, barley reports definitely nice. need some more barley reports yeah. if people can't catch it on the saturday can they watch it on another day Yes, we're used to that by now, aren't we? It's on yeah. forever. It'll be on there forever. And I, I, I do hope you watch it. it will, it's hopefully something really different in our world of whiskey, but also something that brings us all together and feels entertaining and fun, but also while having real talk, you know, talking about some of the real shit that um, is important. Diversity, you know, where are, where are women uh, in this conversation? You know, you look around and, and whiskey is, is white men with beards. Why? Is, that, is it by design? Is it by the attraction? Let's, let's try to unpack it. Even the uncomfortable bits. Let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, conversation needs to be more nuanced than it has been over the last year. We've seen that with tensions escalating in all sorts of ways. I'm not trying to get too political, but I think that whiskey can uh, affect positive political change. It has before. And if we can have play some part in that, then fuck yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Hey, um, Sam, one, one other thing. I heard someone talk about uh, you introducing something, and I know it wasn't your idea, but when you were at Balvenie called Robe Time. And do you think that the world of whiskey is taking mental health seriously enough? That's another thing which uh, I think is interesting, that, that whole idea of taking some time for yourself when you're working really hard. Uh, and when I heard that, right, that this was going on, I was like, that's, Genius. I love that, that whole concept. Uh, and, and as you say about having the conversations which are difficult, even if they are difficult, it's important. Uh, do you think those conversations are having enough? I know yeah, yeah, obviously the obvious one is the men in beards one, but do, do you think that's another side of thing that's, that needs to be discussed? That's a great question. In short, yes, because you look at, um, I, I mentioned Lauren Moat from Diageo. I think her job title is Global Cocktailian, but she's a Canadian who now lives in the Netherlands and she's sort of the head of... Um, Oh my God, Diageo's bar, world class. And one thing that they've in the last in recent years been looking at is is mindfulness and and wellness of bartenders. Because you know you work late at night, 
Mm. Then you go for a beer. Then you have a cheeky mm. cigarette. Then you sleep till four. Then you go to your next shift. It's, it's, it's potential to be dangerous. Um, and so when you respect yourself and you respect your, your job, um, happiness tends to follow. A lot of people say, and what we do, let me first say, so robe time, not my invention, but God, did it resonate? So Jamie Johnson, yeah. uh, our ambassador in Canada, uh, she had this concept. And when you're on the road, Dave, you know, as an ambassador, you're smiling all the time. You're always on small talk. You're, it, 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 it's, it is a dream job. I'm not complaining at all, but it's exhausting as well because you are dealing with the distributor in the morning at a distributor's meeting, 50 people asking you questions. You got to have commercial information ready for them. Then you do a lunchtime training for a strip club and the women are asking questions. Um, you know, this really happened in Texas. This is a real day. Um, and the, the, the staff is asking you questions about the spirit and they want to know about the history. Okay, so then you're talking about history and you're then asking about them. You got to make them like you because you need them to bring in the Belvenny 30-year-old. All, all of this is, is exercising parts of your brain that you don't necessarily think are, uh, are muscles, but they are. And when you then, then you go to an evening event and then you're out all night to just take 15 minutes yeah. uh, as a human, never mind as ambassador, take 15 minutes just to yourself, even just undress, get in a robe, lie in bed, look at your phone, go for a walk with a robe, maybe, I don't know. But just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the idea of just turning off the reset button because you will be such a better person 15 minutes later or half an hour later. And it's, uh, it was a fun thing. That's, that's, that's Jamie Johnson. That's robe time. And it saved, I think it saved some of our lives, actually. <laughs> yeah. I never knew it was called robe time. I remember you, remember you bringing that up before, but yeah, you do need that time because when you are on the road, it's, you know, you, from breakfast until the time you get back into your hotel room, you're with somebody almost mm. all the time. You know, you've got your in-country rep, you've got distributors, you've got local distributors, you've got the bar people, you've got your guests for the tasting. It is constant. You just need those little breaks. I'm just going to go back to the hotel room, shower and change. You just have that cup yeah. of tea. You know, it's little things that you take with you. Like I always take Earl Grey and a packet of ginger nuts with me everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and my coffee, obviously, and olives. But there, there are little <laughs> things that you take away. Um, just so you can just stop and, and like reset. That's what it is. Yeah. People pay monthly for apps to help them do this, but we can all do it. It's at our disposal. And don't feel shame, you know, take a break. Yeah. It's crazy. Your brain is operating at a rate you don't even fully understand. Just just stop and love yourself for 15 minutes. It makes a massive difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. So I'm sorry, sorry for the diversion there for away yeah. from our conversation, but well, I, think, I, think I think it's really important. I think it's really important. Are you um, trying to get a segment to edit into Gemma and Jamie? Or? I'd love to. I, I think I think we need to get in contact with them for, for sure. It'd be oh, great. I mean, love I do it. love I do love Balvany as well, so that would work. But uh, I haven't actually <laughs> sent that message yet. But um, I, I've certainly heard them talk about it, uh, and Jamie in particular. She she really the way she explains it is wonderful as well. So and, it, and but she said it was it was great. Uh, you were essentially a boss at the time, and you encouraged this. And I think it's really important that. We've got people within every industry saying, yeah, take take 10, take 15, do it. I try and say it to Nick all the time when he's edited. Hey, Nick, just just take 10. <laughs> I and, suffer uh, from that. I do. It's, I find it's tough. You, off. you really do. Yeah, it's, it, it is tough, man. We do... We don't support each, in, each other enough in these in these things. I hope that that's one of the blessings in this curse of, of lockdown and COVID is sort of reorganizing our lives in a way that's more conducive to success. And I don't mean success financially, but success is just happiness, joy, and better healthy relationships with our friends and family. Absolutely. And I think that is a really lovely way to end this conversation. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks, guys. guys it's been, it's been great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You're listening to Whiskey and Things. And as always, you can watch the full uncut video of that interview with Sam and Dave on our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash whiskey and things. Sam and Dave. <laughs> on a uh, soul group from the 1960s. <laughs> Chas and I'm Dave, a soul it? man. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure that was Sam and Dave, mate. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, you can also find out more about Great. the Boutique Whiskey Company on their website. Uh, we'll put that link in the show notes. And you can also follow them on their social media accounts, which is at Boutique Whiskey on all of them, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you want to find Dave, that's Instagram.com, uh, Boutique Dave. 
uh, same on Twitter. And Sam is Dr. Whiskey, uh, Dr. Dot Whiskey on Instagram and Dr. Underscore Whiskey on Twitter. So uh, go and find them if you wish. And I thoroughly recommend it. It's great content. Yes, it is. Um, all those links to those pages and socials um, we'll put in the description as well. And I'm also going to put a link in the description to the Gordon Ramsay Uncharted, Untamed Tasmania episode, where the Bell Grove distillery has been featured. It's bloody brilliant. I watched it yeah. earlier on today. It is so interesting. Yeah, if you want to put some images to what we've been talking about today, that's like a good little shout there. But talking about bloody brilliant, this whiskey has been amazing. Just to, to summarise, this is a 49.8% whiskey, mm -hmm. which I have sipped as if it wasn't anything. It's right. so drinkable. It is. I really enjoyed this. It's uh, beautiful. Annoyingly, it looks like it's sold out everywhere, as I, as I mentioned earlier but by all means have a look and you might find something else from that distillery from belgrove elsewhere who knows yeah. but as always with all these independent bottlers that we've spoken to we just think they're amazing we haven't got a single one on which we haven't thought has created amazing produce amazing whiskies so i'm pretty sure anything you find with boutique on you are gonna love so especially if you can find anything from their australian range definitely do yeah and not only that it doesn't matter what style of whiskey you like they're bound to have something if it's still around if it's still available they do rice they do wheats they do bourbons you know single malt. they cover a lot of stuff everything is fantastic yeah really is and i absolutely recommend their podcast we spoke about it a few times that's the uncorked podcast if you search that in your podcast platform you'll find it they have the best guests they have so many great guests they're obviously very well connected people they've been in the industry long enough they have great guests and you learn a lot of stuff about whiskey. But they also, it's just good fun. They have silly games that they play. It's just so engaging. Uh, I love listening to it. So they don't have a routine. I don't feel like they have a routine where it's weekly or anything like that. But when they appear in your podcast mm. downloads, it's always fun to, to have a listen to Sam and Dave and whoever they've got on. So it is. I watch it on YouTube so I can... Uh, oh, do you? Yeah, because they do, the anagram games are on there and it's more visual. So I enjoy oh. watching the YouTube channel, for example. So that may be another option for people if they want to get involved in that. Nice, nice, nice. Mm. Anyway, thank you, Sam and Dave, for being our soul men. <laughs> the whiskey! Well, there we go. That's the end of episode 60. I just want to say thank you, Dave, for purchasing this bottle of whiskey. Um, for this episode, for my birthday, sending over. I feel like I should send you some more samples now. Um, <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll yeah. tell you what. I got you a hat for your birthday. I think I owe you another hat at least. <laughs> no, you I don't. I'll tell you what. <laughs> can you save it for when we're at Abbey Road? I'm not going to. Oh, yeah. I'll be good with that. Yeah. I think Kevin and Adam were going to. Adam in particular, who's a big tequila yeah. drinker, is going to love smelling that. Right, He's going right, to enjoy. Right. I think it'll be one of those ones that we just nice to have along with. Some of the other ones we've collected over this year that are pretty special to have around that period when we're doing that kind of project. I think um, I can arrange that, Dave. I amazing. That. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, it's a super, super tasty whiskey, and I'm glad we finally got to have a Tasmanian whiskey. Could you believe we it? We did it. We did 60 it. 60 shows. Episode 60, shows. 60. It feels good that it was a round number. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yes. The thumbnail is going to look great. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. Should we call this a day? Should we sign yeah. off? Go yes. on then. The angles have had their share. <laughs> what, you've never heard of the, the angles? Who put the question mark on the autoprompt? <laughs> you've never heard of the podcast angles, Dave? The podcast angles have had their share. <laughs> Just say it. So that's all the podcast angels and Tasmanian devils are letting us do this week. We'll be back next week with another joyride of a sensory experience for you. Yes, we Beautiful will. script that, Nick. Beautiful Thanks, script. Buddy. Been waiting for you to say that. <laughs> yes. Cheers. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Share, share. Share, share. <laughs> Amazing. Wow, that's going to be a lovely ending. Whiskey and